There's so much that can be said about these films, but I want to hear a little more from the directors. And so I'll just ask Michelle first um, to just tell us a little bit about what motivated you really to do Stateless and well, how, how are we here today with such a powerful film that, I, that looks at so many in issues, so many intersecting issues as well. Like, how did we get here? Or how did you get there? <laughs> You're on mute. Thank you. Catch line of 2020, 2021. You're on mute. <laughs> Uh, well, first, just thank you very much for the opportunity to screen this film um, in Guyana and be able to share the stories. Um, this is sort of a personal journey for me. My roots lie in the island um, as a woman born in, 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 in Haiti and as a migrant myself uh, with my family. So it sort of touches close to home on many levels. And um, I felt, you know, I've grown up around both Dominican and Haitian culture. Um, both through extended family and um, and just through enjoying both cultures as well, but also knowing, growing up knowing the history that is very complicated between both uh, nations, um, and uh, yeah, just coming out of uh, the last documentary I did back in 2013, um, wasn't sure what direction we were going to take in terms of the stories that we're telling, knowing that. Um, our focus is always in the work that we do with uh, the organization. I founded Rada Studio, Black and Red Humanity and Complicated uh, Lived Experiences. And so when the Sentencia came down in September 23rd, um, the anniversary was just last week, 2013, you know, the wheel started to turn in terms of what is it that. Um, we could do, could this be an opportunity to, to go back to the island? And I spent after that about uh, five years going back and forth um, with that first year, 2013, 2014, being mostly research, not just research, you know, and meeting people, um, understanding the situation on the ground more through the network of uh, friends and colleagues that I had met from previous work I had done um, in Haiti uh, around some short films that I had done. Uh, but also learning more about the history of the massacre of 37 too. Uh, that is something that was pretty consistent um, for me from the get-go that, you know, this new sentencia, this ruling that came was just another manifestation of a continued cycle of anti-Black Latinx violence specifically against Haitian people. And that this genocide that happened in 37 really um, has not been commemorated in the way it should be, certainly from a hemispheric perspective. Um, and understanding the violence of that uh, period across the hemisphere against black and brown bodies. So, so yeah, so that that's kind of um, how I ended up in there. But I think also the story of migration in our diaspora from this perspective too, um, was something that felt that was very close to home. Oh, now you're mute. I <laughs> That is so true. I'm like, I, I just told you about this. <laughs> um, so thank you for that, Michelle. Uh, and I think that's, that's quite interesting. And um, I would really like to hear from Esri about, you know, how did you get the, to, to tell us these films? Well, tell us this story. And that's what really it is. You have a very unique style and a very unique way of sharing something. And I, um, I really want to know, how did we get here for you? <clears throat> Hello, um, Shanita. Hello, everybody. Hello, Guyana. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for the folks at uh, Time Re Festival um, for having me here uh, at the festival. Um, my story, I mean, I came to filmmaking a little late. Um, I you know, had a whole different life before that. <clears throat> and in 2010, I think 2011, I decided to go back to school, etc. Um, but in 2010, before I did that, I went to Cuba, um, and that's where I met um, the Galdez family. Uh, I went there on vacation, and I met a professor who was like, "You need to meet those Haitians," and I was like, "What do you mean, those you know, meet those Haitians?" 
Um, so he took me there. And then um, I always say the first time I, I stepped foot in there, I, you know, I was home. I realized that I was home. I mean, obviously, um, Cuba is very similar in terms of, you know, the weather and, uh, and, and things like that. Um, I, uh, very similar to Haiti, but when I said I was home, I was with family and they, and they received me as such. Um, so I kept on going there. Um, um, but from, from that first visit, we had established that we would, you know, do some work together. Um, so I continued to go there every year. And some of the footage you see in the film here, um, they are um, from that first from that first visit, but some of them are, are as as late as um, 2015 or 2016. The other two films I made more recently, um, What Happened to a Dream Deferred and uh, Pariah, My Brother. Um, so I was here listening to the news uh, of, you know, of these Haitian migrants um, who were basically stuck um, at the border of, of you know, uh, Mexico and uh, the United States. So I started to um, do research and I didn't know anybody who lived there. So I went on Facebook trying to contact some folks and I finally, um, uh, made contacts with a couple of folks there. I went there, I didn't see me, find them. And then I started working on the street, you know, because I know there was, a, you know, there were Haitians there. I went to some Haitian restaurants um, and I went to a club and that's where I met those young, you know, um, guys who, whose dreams, um, or who, who, whose dream is to become uh, rappers in the United States. So that's kind of the, the, the journey through these um, um, three shorts. Um, yes, maybe it's a, it's a unique style, like you say. Um, thank you for, for that. I mean, I don't think it's that unique, but it's, 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 it's coming from a point of me being tired of explaining. You see what I'm saying? Um, because at this point, what's missing, what's lacking, it's not, you know, it's not the knowledge. Um, like, you know, Raoul Peck just said um, in, in his last uh, movie. So what I was going for in this, in this uh, with these shorts was a way to communicate um, that goes beyond narrative, that goes kind of beyond words. Right. Um, so what I was trying to do is invite folks into um, an experience, and um, I don't know. I don't know if I if I if I was successful in that, but uh, that's what I was going for. You mute. <laughs> I'm no expert, but I I would say that you were very successful in doing that. And um, on one point that you actually just made, you said that when you went to Cuba, they said there were those Haitians there, and when I reflect on it. And I think about the, in your film, Un Sola Sangre, there was a particular sentiment that Silvero said in the beginning, he was like, no one wants to be Haitian. And like, when you consider what's happening in the world with <clears throat> the borders, um, we're talking about Tijuana and everything that is that, that's just going on in terms of Haitian migration. What does that really mean to you? And, or how do you really understand that sentiment? And what, what exactly are you putting into that? Or what were you hoping to communicate to the audience by, by just keeping that as one of the first things in that film? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a very interesting question. So as I said, when I when I went there, um, I felt like these folks were family. Sylvia at that time had never been to Haiti. Um, so in the movie, she had never, never been to Haiti at all. She went afterwards. Um, but she spoke, you know, Creole perfectly, um, the way, the way she lived. Um, and Sylvia would tell you, and, you know, the, the title of the film, Una Sola Sangre, actually comes from something she said, right? She said, um, tengo tu tierras, um, so I have two homeland, but I only have one blood. And my blood is, is, uh, is, uh, is Haitian, 100%. So that's that's her that's her point that's her point of view and I you know 
I wanted to start with that um, perspective. But you can see also in the film that other folks kind of feel differently. I mean, the young folks are like, yeah, well, Haitian is there, you know, it's in our culture, et cetera, et cetera. But we are Cubans, you know, <laughs> don't make, make no mistakes about that. We are Cubans. But, you know, it's interesting because in a way, Sylvia is also Cubans, right? Sylvia is Cuban as, as Cuban can be. So she's choosing to, to, to stay Haitian, one, but at, a, at the same time, the folks there see them also as a separate group. Like I said, that, you know, that professor told me, you should meet those Haitians, mm -hmm. right? But in reality, <laughs> Cuban just, just like he was. So I said all that to, to bring, to bring um, the idea of, you know, marginalization and how, um, you know, like, you know, like Bell Hooks would say, some of us make the choice to uh, espouse that uh, marginality, right? Um, because, um, I mean, I mean, it's just like me and, and I don't know for Michelle, the way it is, I mean, if you speak with me, if, well, my accent will get, <laughs> will give me away right away. But if it didn't, you, you know, you won't spend five minutes before you know that I'm patient, right? But, um, so I think it's something that we carry. It's, a, it's, it's you know, us kind of embracing um, these roots that we, we really cherish and that, you know, that has been sustaining us throughout the world. To be honest with you. Thank you. And it's true. So actually, one of the things I did really enjoy, and um, I don't know if anybody in the audience agrees with me, is at the end, you speak about one of the guys that talked, uh, he was like, I'm 100% Cuban. But at the same time, his brother was also there saying that, hey, this is this it, it is like perspective. They're two young people, but the perspectives are so different. One, yes. one is like, I'm 100% Haitian. I know this is a part of my culture, but I'm building my house somewhere else. I'm, yeah. I'm in this area, but I'm away from everyone. And uh, I yeah. want to be there. And the other yeah. guy is like, Haiti is my part of my identity, is a part of my blood. And it's something that I said quite a lot, um, even as we went through the voodoo ceremony, even as, you know, so it, it was interesting to just see two young people have the same yeah. lived experience yeah. to some extent. And just- yeah. And it's okay, right? And it's, it's I mean, you, you, they get to choose. Yes, it's part of their identity, but it's interesting how that culture it was, was passed on <clears throat> more or less. And um, so when I, when I look at the films as well, um, I think about some of the sentiments that we hear, not only um, in, not so much in Una Sola Gran Sangre, but um, in What Happens to a Dream Deferred and also in Stateless, we hear politicians and other persons who have anti-migrant sentiments and you get this idea that West is best. Uh, putting it short, West is best. And so for me, it's like, what impact have you seen, particularly with the persons who participated in your film, but also, or migrants at large, what, what impacts do these sentiments have? And this question is actually for both of you. Um, we, we hear of Trump and his conversations on, on shithole countries and black and brown people. And then in Stateless, we also hear similar sentiments with um, the nationalist group that talk about, you know, it's an us versus them kind of thing. You have your problems on the other side of the border, you need to stay there. And, you know, you're not, you're not a part of us. Yes, there's some level of solidarity. We had some building in the past, but we're, we're not the same. You're just different from me and you need to stay there and I'm here. So what impact have you seen this had, not only in your participants, but also on other persons who, who are migrants, well, Haitian migrants in different spaces? But question to both of you. Well, uh, impact, I mean, there are multiple, there are multiple ways of kind of dissecting that. I would say it's deeper than West is best. It's white is best. And that's what someone right. like Gladys Feliz sort of aspires to, to the point of look at this cognitive dissonance in terms of not even be able to see herself in the mirror. Um, in terms of impact, I mean, it's multiple, right? There's the, the very uh, uh, lived experience of oppression that happens from systemic abuse, uh, which leads to invisibility like statelessness and the bureaucratic violence that people face on a day-to-day -day basis when they walk out the door. Um, so there's that aspect of it, but there's the other aspect of it that is the resistance, right? That we see with the migration. I mean, people are leaving or migrating through, that is the form of resistance, right? To, with your feet, pick up and go, 
right? And walk away from, uh, uh, from the danger, from the fear, from the oppression, from the dehumanization, right? To make, to, uh, 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 to live uh, 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 your full humanity. And I would say that, and then you see that sort of in, in stateless, you see that expression in different ways between Rosa and, and, um, and Teofilo. For me, I see Teofilo as a modern day Maroon in the sense that mm -hmm. it's not a question of being a refugee. On the contrary, it's another symbolic uh, um, gaze towards Haiti and the mountains of Haiti being uh, a space of potential liberation and recognizing one's full humanity and understanding that that's not, that's not happening in the land where I was born, maybe in the land of my ancestors, I can find it. And even when we think about the story of Moraime, it's this idea of liberation is on the other side of the island, right? And so there is that sort of, 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 of uh, what um, Esri just mentioned in this, this sense of, of, of connecting to the ancestors in a way that we can embrace our full humanity. And so Teofilo for me represents that. And in some ways he's opted out of the system, which is I think uh, a, a way of preserving oneself, right? Um, and then there's the other side that is Rosaides, who I think still has some faith in the in the system. Not that I necessarily agree agree 100 with her, but I am totally behind her in terms of how she embodies that, right? And her 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 fiercelessness, her fierceness and fearlessness in 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 um, pursuing what she believes is important and how she feels um, and how she connects and engages with her community. Um, and so those are things that have been always present in our Black Atlantic <laughs> uh, existence from the moment, you know, the first, you know, uh, slave ships arrived. Uh, our full humanity has always been expressed in different ways. And so, um, so you get sort of this multitude of reactions, right? From the Gladyses who don't accept the blackness, right? In the response to white supremacy as a way and sometimes of unconscious survival to Teofilo who is uh, for me, the modern day Maroon. So for me, it, it really, um, we pick different ways of resisting, right? And, and, and uh, I think it's important to be able to hold them up and feel in some ways inspired and understanding as Angela Sa Davis says for us in many ways, the freedom is in the actual struggle itself. Um, we may not get there, but the fact that we are trying to live it on a day-to-day -day basis and push it is where we have to find those moments of joy and, 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 um, and resistance. Thank you. Esri? Yes, um, I don't know if I have to add anything here because I think Michelle covered it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I you know I like to talk about a, a specific anti sentiment anti Haitian sentiment um, that um, you know we can see through history really um, and and what we see today um, the news for example that is coming from Texas is a continuation, I think, of, of, that, uh, of that sentiment. And, you know, in stateless, I think one of the, one of the brilliant thing and beautiful thing that is done is the, the rapprochement, like they would say, the kind of putting together of, you know, what's happening now and, and what happened in, in 1937. Um, and that continues if we look at you know if we look at immigration in the U.S. in the 1980s, where uh, the Reagan administration opened you know their arms to the Cubans, they're like, yeah, please come, come, and the Haitians, they're like, no, you people stay where you <laughs> stay where you are. As a matter of fact, we are not going to recognize you as refugees, although we are creating the conditions in your country. Mm -hmm. you, we are destabilizing your country enough for you to leave. Um, so we see this on over, over and over again. Um, again, in the 1980s with, with, with the AIDS um, crisis, right? I don't know if you folks are old enough to remember the-, the <laughs> Maybe not old enough, but old enough to read. <laughs> I'm old, enough to have <laughs> I'm old enough to have <laughs> to remember the the 4H club, right? Which was the, the, the group of people 
who were basically responsible for AIDS, right? And that was homosexuals, um, hemophiliacs, heroin users, and Haitians. Um, and again, um, like Michelle was saying earlier, you know, we chose to fight and fight and fight. Um, and, you know, we win some of these fights, some of them we lose, but we continue to fight. And I like the idea that Michelle put forward in terms of uh, migration as a, as a form of resistance. Um, and, you know, that's what everybody, that's what we have been doing as humans, right? When things are not good here, we move somewhere else. But all of a sudden, when it's you know us moving around, you know it becomes a crisis, right? So now you know now all of a sudden there's a there's a migration crisis. Um, but in terms of resistance, I one of the things that I think I try to do in these films is to also show these folks as you know regular people, right? Um, um, you can be good, you can be bad, you can be a hero, you can be a villain, you can be whoever, you can be whatever, right? But I feel like there's always a, kind of a burden of being good people, of being responsible, uh, responsible, of being respectable that is, that is put on the, on the migrant, right? On, on, on the other, as if I had to kind of demonstrate to you that I'm worth, you know, being here, that I'm, you know, anyway. <laughs> anyway, it's so. <laughs> it's a sentiment of having to be better than, you have to, you have to work hard, you have to be better, you're not allowed to be so-called average or less than average because you're always seen, even if you're giving your best, it's not, it's not, it's never good enough, quite frankly. And so you exactly. also mentioned, something that, you know, in, in a Guyana context, you even see this as well. Their categories of what, what what constitutes the right type of migrant, and even even in the sentiments mentioned by by Trump, and then the follow up sentiments you have featured in that film, from stuff that was being aired um, in the media at the time, we talk about the type of migrants that you want. Why are persons coming from the shithole countries as opposed to coming from countries like Norway? We Norway, want Norway. Yes, they said. You know, yeah. We don't want we don't want the we don't want the, the we don't want the people with African blood, and even in um, yeah stateless also. There's parts of it that talk about. Dominican Republic having having traces so strong ties to Africa in terms of your eth their ethnicity, but we want to move away from that. We want to make a Dominican Republic a white country, and in Guyana well, we want did, certain types did. of migrants. We don't want we don't want we were going to treat the Haitians differently as opposed we, as, as opposed to how we treat Cubans and <clears throat> Cubans or Venezuelans. And it's like oh okay no the categories of otherness is just something that prevails in in the conversations of of migration and I, I i wish it would go somewhere but i might not live to see that i might not live to see that um yeah. and so when i think about that as well I, I mean michelle i'm not going to lie to you when i was when i first looked at your film i'm like where was this going and this is when gladys first appeared on the screen i was like okay maybe i'm misinterpreting what's happening here what's happening i thought this was going to be a migration film this is this is going to be something that's very very left and then she was talking about what? <laughs> so my question to you is, like, why did you find it necessary to feature the ultra nationalist views in, in stateless? And what was, what was the importance? What were you hoping to communicate to the audience by, by, by doing that? Because I was confused, very, very confused at first, but then I recognized, okay, Michelle must know what she's doing. Why, why are we, why, why did you take us there, Michelle? <laughs> uh, well, because uh, for me, it was important to deeply understand the level of the stakes that were at play for those Aedes in the community um, and the banality of hatred that, that, that exists. And it's not just in the Dominican Republic, but also to make a hemispheric connection around the rhetoric that we hear in the United States or elsewhere, it's not just there, it's all over, it's all over. It's a global movement and it's represented by people in our own communities and in some cases in our own families, right? And so for me, it was uh, very important that uh, Gladys be present so we understand exactly the extent to which the, the hatred uh, is uh, deeply held, but also that what Rosaides is up against, you know? Um, I think uh, without Gladys's voice, the threats that we see 
and we hear about on social media that Rosa Iris hears and we talk about um, would not be would not um, be absorbed <laughs> as deeply by the audience when you can put a face to to the hatred in that way then you can actually root for Rosa even more I feel so um, and of course I think it's also important that Gladys not be dismissed as a caricature um, that we understand that she too is a human being and that we're up against these human, these, <laughs> this belief system that is, that is a religion, right? In some ways it has a religious sort of own, its own um, circularity of, of, um, of belief that facts will not change, right? And we see that in, 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 in the works. And so, yes, for me, her voice was, was uh, quite crucial. We actually had some discussions in the edit room about whether we should include her, but at the same time, this is not an advocacy film, right? It's not, a, it's not an advocacy film in the sense that it's um, uh, 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 propaganda in that way. It's, it's a, a film that I hope shows a complicated nature of how um, hatred is expressed and that we don't often talk enough about um, the anti-Black hatred that exists within our communities. Certainly not within the Latin American uh, 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 various communities that exist and how white supremacy is expressed. And so um, I needed to put a face to what Rosa was up against, what Rosa Iris was up against, that it's not just the president, right? <laughs> Who has his own propaganda and his own machinery behind him, but sometimes it's our neighbor it's our neighbor and it could be even a member of our family. So how do we deal with that? That's so true. And I see video um, taking a bit of a uh, scare by Gladys liking so much sugar in her coffee. And it's like, she did become very real, even for me as we went along. And I think I started to appreciate the role that she was playing in, playing in that particular film. I may not have agreed with her, but I, you know, I can entertain her thoughts and see where she might have been going and or, or I mean, she became very real after some point and actually what I found interested in her even in her character as well was two things the first was <coughs> one the, the, the her finding it absolutely necessary to mention that her ex-partner was black sometimes we find that sentiment oh my friend is black but that means what what does that mean that you're not racist what are you communicating yeah, that's to classic yeah <laughs> my friend's not black okay <laughs> and then the, the the sentiments as well that was coming from the president that was very defensive we're not trying to whiten the nation but no we have a national regular regularization plan that excludes only black people what exactly are you saying and then when you move that as well and you look at gladys and how complex her particular character was or the role that she plays it's she speaks of the Haitian contribution and she speaks of how even up to 1965 Haiti helped them to steer up stave up the United States and then when we look at this, we, we wonder, well, where do people really place Haiti's contribution to the, to, to the region? We, Haiti started, Haiti is a reason we, we, we all know what freedom really is. It started in the 1970s, sorry, in the 1700s. Why am I going to the, I'm young, but I'm, I'm mixing my years up. I mean, I'm not that young. In the, in the 1700s, and it, it kind of, it, it was a catalyst for a movement that led to us all being here, well, in, in free countries. And I wonder how, how, how exactly do you see or how do you, do you understand persons to, to look at look at your film only and then also understand the contribution of Haiti to the, to the region, the country, and well, I guess you could say to this entire Western hemisphere. I'm sorry, what is your question? <laughs> It was because it was it was um just just for you to position um Haiti's contribution and oh, how do you see when people yeah. see Haiti's contribution because I, I have right, sent okay. to, but yeah. this is about you, not me. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, you know, th there are two things I feel, you know, uh I had a previous uh sort of uh career before going into film. Uh, storytelling. I worked in in uh, international aid and also worked as a as a human rights lawyer. And for me, what I realized, you know, uh, and I came upon uh, storytelling and filmmaking, you know, sort of serendipitously through 
uh, relationship, uh, relationships and my current partner, uh, life and creative partner today. But what really drew me in when I was exposed to it is understanding that you can't, ch you, you can only, you can change laws up to a certain extent, which is also why it was important to have Gladys's voice too. But the things that really change us deeply is cultural shift, shift in understanding history, a shift in understanding even our mythologies, right? That shape us. And that's why I think that I'm sort of a culture maker, I'm culture builder through storytelling and building alternative narratives that can have an impact on a different level than say laws. And you cannot, you cannot support laws without a common understanding of culture, which is why even today, you know, laws, anti-abortion laws are still sort of on the books right now that people are fighting because we don't have a common understanding of what women's rights looks like. I'm giving that just as an example. And the same in this idea of, of anti-Black hatred and even our vision of, 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 of what Haiti represents, you know, uh, symbolically to this hemisphere. And so we've been fed a mythology, right, in order to continue this machine of racist capitalism, right? Uh, um, that means that anything connected to Haiti, um, as, as we said, it's even beyond just anti-Blackness. There's this idea of Haiti itself, which is a thorn <laughs> in the butt of white supremacy because of its mere existence, right? And so we have to sort of, you know, I, I've, I've been doing some work with Incultured Company around um, uh, conflict resolution even in discussions between Dominicans and Haitians and collaboration between M Dominicans and Haitians and understanding that in conflict resolution, even coming to a common understanding, in order to us even have a dialogue, we need to understand the same basis of history, right? Which is why here there are there's attacks against what they call critical race theory or the revisioning of history because narrative is so important in terms of understanding who we are. And once that is attacked, people feel vulnerable and threatened, right? And so, but that's where the work has to be done. And it means, you know, revisiting exactly the impact of Haiti historically to today and our relationship and how our, th these other uh, uh, more powerful nations have reacted to the presence and what that means for us today. So it's, there's a lot of work to do, <laughs> but yes, um, um, we have to revisit all of that in order to really kind of fight against the systemic forces that want to keep you know, things down. Completely agree. And, and just last, I mean, in some oh, ways, go ahead. Here, we owe, <laughs> a ahead, debt. We owe a debt to <laughs> Haiti, as you, as you express, we owe a debt to Haiti for being that presence, for being that presence, that challenge throughout, you know. Yeah. yeah. Ezri, is there something you want to add there or? You feel yeah, no, no. I was <laughs> I was listening to Michelle and, and, and shaking my head. Um, because I mean the the contribution of Haiti to world history, to universal history, like they would say, is you know, I think <laughs> by now we all agree that 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 it's real. Um I just picked up a, a book just recently by what's her name, Chanda Prescott Weinstein, and the book is called The Disordered Cosmos. And she started the book, and um, like the first few pages, she's like to Haiti, where it all started, right? So he's one, you know, he's somebody who un who, un who understand that contribution. But what I really wanted to say is that. Um, that contribution is probably the reason why <laughs> that you know anti-sentiment Haitian is still there. And you know, you talk about the region, and I would like to, to stay there just a minute to invite folks to think about 1804, Haiti become and became independent in a um, society where slavery is still the norm. Can you understand what that means? If you were a, a, a white colonist in Jamaica, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, yeah, these Haitians, you know, they are strong. They, you know, they understand freedom. They really um, brought the idea of, of, of human rights to, to, to its uh, acceptable conclusion. Is that what you're going to say? No, 
you're going to say, no, these black people, they are killing white women and white babies, right? They are, they, they are devil's uh, worshiper. These are not people you wanna associate with. And I think, I mean, I think that sentiment is still there. It's still there, we see it. We see it manifested in 1937. Uh, um, you know, in the Dominican Republic, we see it many times, many times, we, and we just saw it just recently in Texas. That is so true. And it's like, you, you, you say this, and I, I, I'm taken aback to some of the sentiments that we heard, again, Gladys and her group of friends there, that they were talking about, they were labeling Haitians as rapists, murderers, troublemakers, torturers, some of the worst, I mean, some of the worst people that are bringing this crime into the Dominican Republic, co committing acts of all sorts of violence against those people. And I'm like, but so people in your country, they don't commit crimes. <laughs> I mean, like, is it, is it specific to this group of people? What, what, what's with the otherness? But also Ezra, you just made a really good point, And it's something that I really appreciated in, Unsola Sangre is the way you kind of took time to expose the Haitian culture, particularly a, an aspect of it that has been demonized for years. And like, if you if you really understand voodoo, it's a it's a practice of resistance. It's something that survived. It's something that is that <laughs> despite the white despite the whitewashing, despite all the years of trying to break a spirit, the spirit of these people. They were able to, for more, for more, for the most part, conceal that religion and keep it alive. Because oftentimes, if you if you're exposed to Haitian culture well enough, you'll know that um, people often associate Haitian Catholics with voodoo practitioners simply because a lot of the symbols of voodooism is hidden in Catholic symbols, hidden behind the scenes. You have a lot of it that was just there because it wasn't allowed. You weren't allowed to practice your religion, but they might they, they as an act of resistance, voodoo is something that survived. And so for me, seeing that. In that particular film was really good it, it gave exposure to how people and how that culture could still survive even, even though you moved to a different place and um i, I want to know yeah. like, why, why did you why did you emphasize it why did we see the cabrit um <laughs> almost get goat sorry that's haitian creole for goat <laughs> almost get killed why did you bring the cabrit into the into the, into the mix <laughs> look sunira if you want to change the language of this um, interview. No, 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 we can't do that. I'm a hundred percent down. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna expose you. Actually, I'm gonna expose her as one of us. Okay. Um, good to see you again, Sunita. Um, the voodoo thing. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's. I'm glad you you asked this question because it it was not an easy decision, and I'm gonna say why. Because exactly of that stigmatization that we're talking about because of the way the religion, the culture of voodoo has been represented in, in, in cinema and in literature and culture in general. I was asked, I had to ask myself, what is it that I'm going to do, right? Am I going to perpetuate whatever is being said? Am I, am I, am I contributing to that, you know, um, you know, um, vilification of, of, of Haitians, or do I have something new to say? Um, or not new, but different. Um, so I decided to, to put it there anyway to, to show, and I think we had that discussion um, earlier when we were preparing, um, the fact that you cannot really dissociate, you know, um, Vodou, Haitian from, the Haitian culture as voodoo, you cannot separate it, separate it from Haitians, right? And I think that's what Michelle was saying better than, than, than I can. But the idea of voodoo as a site of resistance, that's really what I was interested in showing because these folks, I don't think they would have survived as Haitian if it wasn't, you know, for the voodoo. Now, you also have to be careful, and that's why, you know, in the sacrifice of the good, because I had to be careful not to be, not, to, you know, to be viristic, right? This is not about, you know, showing you, no, this is me doing my thing, and I'm going to take control of it, right? So I'm going to decide what to show you and what not to show you. Like Sylvia was saying in the film, right? 
you know, we have spaces that are for people outside. <laughs> we have spaces that are for people inside, right? So I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna um, show certain things. Not, not because I'm ashamed or whatever like that, but because I'm in control. And I agree with you. So the, 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 thing, the thing about voodoo that baffles me sometimes is there are aspects of that particular practice. Muslims sacrifice animals. But again, it's always this conversation of otherness when it comes to Haitian culture and Haitian people. And I, I don't know <laughs> if we're ever going to quite escape from that or run from that or when will we see that, that we're not that different in that sense. Everybody just has their own way of doing, doing and being and just living. Um, also, I mean, what's more, uh, what's more uh, sacrificial than eating the lamb of God? Like, isn't that? Are <laughs> they lamb chops? How dare you? It's not even the lamb. Yeah, it's like, the I'm flesh of God. I'm drinking blood too. I mean, wh where did that come from? Lamb chops. <laughs> <Christianity>, like, <laughs> not in you neither. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's like. We don't draw these, we, we never draw these, these lines. And I remember when I, somebody, uh, we put a news agency had posted when the earthquake hit uh, recently in Haiti. And one of the comments in the comment section, somebody was like, oh, it, it, the country needs to turn away from all the evil that they do. And there's the evil that cause all, like, are you listening to yourself? <laughs> like, yeah. Are you listening but, to yourself? <laughs> but you, th you know, um, so these folks, we can always hear them, we, you know, we know who you are. But I think what, what's more sad is when we kind of internalize this about things and we have to be very clear, right? We have to be very clear in the way that we as black people, we as Haitians, we as Caribbean people, we were made to hate our own selves. In my household, when I was growing up, um, I could never, ever in my life, I could even think of bringing a drum to my grandfather's house. That would be the end of it. Now, if the radio is playing Bookman Experience, for example, which was not even a religious group, I could not listen to that either in my house, right? So there are ways that we hate ourselves. We are taught to hate ourselves when we internalize that, that thing. And I think that's something we really need to, to talk about also. Yeah. And I think just one thing connected to that, it goes back to this idea of you know, um, our full humanity. Um, there's this whole movement called Afro-pessimism that talks about the notion that even the, what it means to be human has, it requires anti-Blackness. I don't want to get into the details of it and just no, it's how true. react to it, but um, um, what voodoo represents, you know, what the drum represents is the full humanity of the people who had to go through that transatlantic, you know, uh, uh, purgatory into here that we continue to express a full humanity that is not accepted, and that those it's those connections that mean we are human, and people don't in order to continue to perpetuate what you talk about how we internalize to perpetuate the inequities to to rationalize it and justify it the way Gladys does is by not accepting that part of being human, right? How that humanity is expressed. So it's really fundamental that this internalized aspect, if we don't address it, we'll never accept our own full humanity. And the upside of that is, it's not like the oppressor doesn't have issues either. <laughs> it's like there's a pathologizing on that level as well, that is just toxic for everybody, you know? So true. And it's like, I really like the example that um, Ezri used in terms of like not being able to bring a drum into his house. I mean, for me personally, I'm Haitian Guyanese. Yes, I was born in Haiti, but I grew up in Guyana. The, re the way I learn about Haitian culture is by when I visit Haiti and I, I, I like to ask a lot of questions. So it might not be necessarily that I, I have never been, I've never been to a voodoo ceremony or any of these things, but I would like to go. I would like to, I would like to see what's on the inside. I'm definitely intrigued by the culture and I try to learn different things. I think that's one of the first things I said to Ezra. Your name is very similar to one of the one of the more popular loas. And a loa, for those who don't know, is a, is a is a spirit. 
And so there are different laws for different purposes. And it's similar to the same way that Hindus have God and goddesses. And it's- Watch out. <laughs> I'm not scared. I'm not scared. And so you, but in Haiti, even in Haiti of itself, it's, 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 there's a conflict between Protestants and people, people who are pro Protestants and they see voodoo as the most evil thing. And then people who are actual voodoo practitioners, but there's still space allowed for voodoo to continue. I don't think that there's anything that's going to have that go. I see someone in the comment section asking on um, video, he's asking, on the question of voodoo in Haiti, are there connections with Santeria practice? I, I'm, I'm still learning. I can't, this is outside of my scope. Does anyone know? Um, yes, I mean, I'm not an expert either, um, but if you take Santeria, um, Kutombre in Brazil, all these Afro-Caribbean um, um, religions, I think there's a lot of similarity in them. Um, I'm not gonna go in what I don't know, but I know, for example, that um, some of the gods, um, like Agwe, who is the mm -hmm. god of, of water in Voodoo, has a, um, how do they say that? Um, corresponding spirit in Centuria, in Kondambre, um, Yemaya in, in Centuria has um, their own, uh, um, so I, you know, I don't know the. I, I'm not an expert, and I don't want to take that role. We're all but learning. I think, I think <laughs> definitely um, there are some connection there, but that's one thing. So the second thing is these folks themselves. Um, these folks themselves in in the in the film, they have a way of kind of going in and out of these religions that is that is so interesting to see right because they are living as full Haitians but also they are living as full Cubans so they are you know in conversation with with um, um, the other religions there too and they're at, at the same time they're always navigating multiple identities and that's something that's very prevalent of course in their film. it's like I'm Haitian <laughs> and I, you didn't quite go into this but Sometimes I, I'm, I'm not Haitian enough. <laughs> you speak Haitian Creole, but you sound white. I get that all the time. You sound yeah, like a white yeah. person. I'm like, but you understand me, right? And I understand you. So like, where's the problem? Exactly. <laughs> so there's always, exactly. There's always these things we navigate with or, or intersecting identities because at no time am I one thing. I'm a Haitian Guyanese woman. I'm I'm a light skinned person. I I get a, I'm a, in the minority when I'm in Haiti. So it's like there's so there, there are different things, right? And so, yeah. um. <clears throat> I think my final question to you, unless there's anything else you guys would like to have, I mean, what, Michelle, for you first, and then Esri, what, for persons who are watching your film, what is the one thing you want them to take away? Mm -hmm. Ah, big, small question, but big thing. <laughs> what is the one takeaway you want persons to have from State Plus? I mean, you know, I feel like everyone brings their own baggage, which is what mm -hmm. art is about and stories, you know, everyone brings their own baggage to what they watch and how they, they you know, um, how they absorb it and how they react. I mean, I've gotten into arguments with people <laughs> about reactions in the film and other people who, you know, um, who've, you know, have felt really inspired by what they've seen. So it kind of runs a gamut. I think for me personally, just in terms of the relationships I've built with Rosaides, with Teofilo, with, you know, uh, the people who are involved in the movement, it's really just um, the inspiration that someone like Rosaides sort of uh, represents uh, for me is what um, I've taken away, certainly from the experience. Um, and I'm really humbled by her determination and understanding that there are, you know, thousands of other Black women like her working not just in the DR and Haiti and elsewhere, um, you know, who, 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 who merit support and, 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 and uplifting. So that for me is sort of the key um, um, that, um, you know, for me that, that, that sort of continues to resonate. Um, and she's continuing to do the work uh, uh, as a as a uh, an asylee here in the United States. Uh, she's now currently just got her LLM uh, from uh, American oh. University in Human Rights and Human and Humanitarian Law through a scholarship that she obtained and is working with migrants from Central America in Pittsburgh, where she's based, as well as some Haitians who also arrived to the community there. So um, I'm just you know inspired and humbled to be you know be able to share the story. 
I know that's really a disservice, all that work. And I'm asking you one question, <laughs> but the same question comes to you, Esri. Um, first for what happens to a dream deferred? And I would like for you to close it off with un sola sangre. Yeah, um, well, I don't, I'm not sure that I have something that I, you know, I want people to take away from. I mean, that's, that sounds like a weird thing to say since, you know, you make a film and people are going to watch it. You must have had intention. Your main message. <laughs> yeah, but I don't really have a message, right? I yeah, I don't really have a message, but I really wanted to um, share that experience that I have um, um, with Sylvia and, and, and her brothers and sisters in Cuba and with these folks in Tijuana. Um, for me, it's not, um, and that's something I say in all the, you know, all, anytime I talk about this and I did say that here, because for me, this is not really um, their story. You know what I mean? I, this is my story also. Um, in a way, um, my personal experience of migration is not that different from what you saw with what happened um, uh, um, to a dream deferred. So in a way, it is also my story that I'm sharing with you. It's my own experience. Um, I hope you can get into that space. Um, and like Michelle was saying, when you make work that is, that is open enough, I think, um, you invite people to um, not only share your experience, but also bring their own experience in the work. Like I've met, you know, young people who said, oh yeah, that film remind me of when I was in university and I had no money, I was in the dorm, right? So which has nothing to do with migration or immigration at all, but because it's a human experience, um, I think folks, um, can still participate in it. That's awesome. So that was actually my last question to you. I see someone in the audience is asking, um, do you guys have a website or ways of contacting you for persons who might be interested to, in using the films for educational purposes? And uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you um, want contact information you want to share, website you might have, an email address or something, but I'm, that's that. my questions were open. I'm, I was just asking for, on behalf of someone in the comments section. Romola, I see you're back with us here. Yes, I am. Yeah. So Michelle was sharing her information. Hi, Michelle. Okay. And me, if you look me up, I don't have a website, but my full name is Ezri Desir. You'll find me on Instagram, Facebook, um, anywhere. Yeah, young and popping. <laughs> and we'll be, I'll just say, we'll, we'll have, we'll be releasing Ezri's films on Studio Nancy TV, so they'll be available to watch there. Awesome. Thanks for the support. Of course, of course. Hi. All right. Thank you, Ramola. Yes, thank you all. This was a wonderful panel. Wonderful films, wonderful panel. Great conversation. Suniti, you did a fantastic job. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> all right. I was worried. And with that, right. we're at the end of Tamari Film Festival for 2021. Um, I certainly enjoy putting together the program and working with the rest of the team. Um, if you all could just show your faces, please. Alicia and Yafet. <laughs> oh, you came for them directly. <laughs> we could turn their cameras on, that would be nice. There you go. Hello, hello. Hello, hey, Alisa. Hi, Ezri, how are you? Hey. Good, good, good. Hey, Michelle. Hello, how are you doing? <laughs> Right, so we basically worked together to put this on, and now we're at the end, and it's sad time, but um, at the same time, you know, very appreciative of your time, and we'll see how next year goes. <laughs> all right, thank you, thank you all, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. All right, Michelle, take care, bye bye. bye. Bye, everyone.